podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Patricia Zestoki from the Development Services Administration. And this afternoon, we welcome you to the August 19th Rate Advisory Group. I'm now going to turn this over to Jennifer. Please know that this meeting is being recorded. Jennifer? All right. Thank you, Patricia. Um, Welcome again, everyone, to our August Rate Review Advisory meeting. Um, welcome both to our group members and members of the public who are present. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so our agenda for today um, will include a summary of requests and updates since our last meeting on July 29th, um, sharing of additional preliminary findings from the recent data collection um, for our FY24 rate focus areas um, and state team recommendations for the FY24 focus areas. And we've also allocated time for open discussion before we adjourn. Um, next slide, please. Um, as we near the end of this rate review cycle, I would like to thank you all for being a vital part of Secretary Schrader and Deputy Secretary Simon's commitment to the development of adequate and sustainable rates. Um, this effort promotes the vision and mission of the DDA community and your participation and contribution that's the precedent for an open, informed, and transparent process for reviewing rates. Um, next slide, please. Okay, members were sent an email with meeting minutes on Monday, August 15th, um, with, and also the revised and approved June meeting minutes and draft July minutes um, for approval. But both of those were in that email. Um, is there any conversation about the July minutes before I motion to approve those minutes? Oh, this is Scott Hollingsworth. Um, okay. you, you have me listed as present. I was not present. Okay, we will make that correction. Thank you. Sure. Any other conversation about the July minutes? Okay, as chair, I will make a motion to approve the minutes. Um, would a member like to second? I second. Thank you. And all in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. All right, since our last meeting, we have several updates to share. Um, the request by Mr. Parks to add details to the June meeting minutes um, was completed and distributed to members on Monday, August 15th. Um, the amended section is found on page six in the third and fourth paragraph. Um, these minutes were previously approved pending the addition of these details, and we will post the minutes to the RREG website following this meeting. Um, the RREG charter is in the final stages of review and will be posted on the RREG webpage once final, which should be very soon. Um, again, this charter details our objectives, our goals, as well as the expectations and responsibilities um, for both internal and external members of the group. And I will turn it over to Robert for our next item. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Oh, you can go back one slide, Patricia. Great, thank you. Um, so next I'd like to acknowledge the request by members for the state to share raw fiat uh, day habilitation and EAG data. Uh, the state team has discussed each request separately and concluded that in each instance, 
uh, we would not be able to meet the request. And some of the factors that went into this decision was, was the fact that the data around individuals and providers are shared in confidence with the state. Uh, proprietary information contained within the files makes the identifying the data unrealistic. Uh, any amount of individual provider data runs the risk of identification, you know, simply by uh, the process of elimination. <clears throat> uh, with that said, however, the state will continue to share data summaries and take additional analyses requests or various looks at the data. Further and in alignment uh, with some of the uh, processes and, and other Medicaid funded services, provi providers still have the ability to share raw data with each other um, if, if they so desire to do so. Uh, we want to thank you for your understanding of our position and patience as we considered your request. So, now I'd like to turn it over to Cynthia Woodcock from Hilltop to Robert. give an update on the GL collection template. Robert, it, it's Chris Parks. Uh, just real quick, in in the, if you're unable to provide the, you know, redacted data, is it possible in the future that when we put out a data collection request, that we would ask the provider if they are okay if it's shared with the group? I'm trying to think. So we, we can certainly look at that, but I think that that would still create an administrative burden in, in trying to track that, Chris. But again, if, for example, there are a group of you who, who wanted to share your data amongst each other, you know, certainly you, you can you can do do so. I, this is Laura. I just to support what Chris is saying. I think it's really disappointing that um, there's no way to find a um, pathway to sharing data, <clears throat> um, especially in light of um, how the data has been presented in past meetings. Um, so I guess we'll just have to see what how what impact that has on the process moving forward. Cynthia. Hi, everybody. I'm Cynthia Woodcock. I'm the executive director at Hilltop. And um, I just wanted to give you a quick update on the general ledger template. Um, we are making some final tweaks to it. Um, and um, then um, we're hoping to, and, and just to review on the template, you know, it's, it's really something that it's going to help us collect very detailed data from all of you in a consistent way. Um, and the idea is that the general ledger data will inform rebase years um, to help us have a more informed rate development process. Um, data is going to be collected on service level revenue, expenses, and units of service. Um, we're very prepared to provide technical assistance to providers through um, webinars, um, manuals, one on one conversations, whatever's needed to help assist with good data collection. Our timeline, as we talked about at the last meeting, was to um, pull together a group of providers to pilot test the general ledger template with us this fall, with the idea of being able to present to the RAG in January a final template that has been tested. And um, so um, that, and then the idea, so in January, and then also, um, you had asked at the last meeting if you would have an opportunity to review the template before we pilot test it. And um, we do want to share that with you. As I said, we're making some final tweaks to it. Um, and we are going to be sending it out to the RAG um, in the next week or so, so that you can review it. We're going to ask that you send us your comments in writing. We thought we'd give you 30 days, so you've got plenty of time to look it over. And um, we would be glad to have your feedback. Um, and then we'll incorporate your comments before we start pilot testing. Um, as far as the pilot testing goes, um, we, um, 
the goals of that are going to really be able to to get a sense of the clarity of the instructions that we provided um, and um, the extent to which the template is aligning with the cost and revenue and unit of services categories within providers accounting systems and also we want to test the use of the online platform that we plan to use for collecting the data so we really want it to be a smooth rollout um, and you know our, our plan was to try to roll it out on july 1st of next year of 2023 for the first year of data collection um, we are looking to pull together a diverse group of providers we'd like to have some from the early adopters We'd like to have small providers, large providers, providers that specialize in di different services so that we can really pilot test with a cross section. Um, we're really hoping that all of you can help us in pulling together this group. Um, and if, you know, if there are specific providers that you know of who can help us, we'd like your input. And perhaps when you send us feedback on the template, you can give us feedback on that as well. But welcome any suggestions here if you want to take a minute. Okay, we'll ask you for feedback when we send out the template. Um, finally, one of the things that all of you at, were talking about at the last meeting was the frequency of reporting. Um, we had talked about collecting general ledger data just in, just in the years that we want to use for rebasing. So it would only be every couple of years. Um, you know, right now we don't have a firm date on when we're planning to have that first rebase year. But a number of you said, you know, it'd be really good to have data collected more frequently um, so that we have really good data to work from as we examine some of these other issues in non-rebase years. Um, you know, I think we've all kind of recognized the limitations with the data we've been working with this year on some of the analyses that um, um, Optimus and Hilltop have been working on. Um, so what I'd like to propose is during the pilot phase, we can talk more with providers about what the possibilities are there. I mean, do we ask for general template data every year? Is there some more limited version of data that we co could collect in the off years? Um, but we'll, you know, we'll work with the providers to get a sense of what the burden would be and um, report back to you in January. Any comments or questions on that? Ms. Cynthia, Chris Parks, uh, just curious, yes. would this be in addition to the current cost report? or in lieu of the current cost report? Well, my understanding, the cost reports are for PCIS2 only. So the general ledger would be for data collection under the new LTSS system. So there would mean, need to be some mechanism to collect data annually, I would assume, continue going forward, just like we have in PCIS2, correct? Well, okay. yes, if, if that's what we're hearing from all of you, yes, absolutely. Well, I think it provides a level of consistency in, in the provider on the provider side too. I mean, you do have staff turnover occasionally, and if, if I'm doing a report once every five years, you're you're going to have it's going to be more difficult to complete accurately with no prior history. If you do it every year, you've got a pattern, and you've got uh, you know hopefully the question's already answered by the time we get to the rebase year. Yeah, I I agree with you for sure. So yes, it would be great if we could move to that more frequent collection. Thank you. Other comments? Okay, I will turn it over to Jennifer, I believe. Uh, yes, I think we have one more um, item to talk about before we move forward discussing more of the analysis. Um, so that is some discussion around fixed and variable costs. Um, there was a request from our REG members for further discussion on fixed and variable rate components. And in response, the state would like to host a one hour um, open REG meeting to have a more detailed conversation on the issue with the hope that we can use that conversation as an opportunity to reach more of a mutual understanding um, on the issue. Um, an email poll was distributed on August 12th members um, to help establish a meeting date um, in consideration of the schedules of the co-chairs um, and in an effort to reach a quorum 
Um, we are proposing the date and time of Friday, September 16th from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, please send an email to Emily Ornstein at emily.ornstein at maryland.gov to confirm your attendance, and she will send out a meeting invitation. Go to the next slide, and I will turn it over to Leslie. Thanks, Jennifer. So what we're going to do now is walk through um, the final results based on the transportation and the staffing ratio analyses. And then we're going to talk through what um, some of the internal discussions resulted in after looking at these um, data points. So we'll start with transportation. On this slide, um, we have the updated numbers for submissions based on the information that was populated for each tab um, of the transportation component. So for instance, there were 41 total providers that populated something on the day habilitation tab for 2019. And based on some of the data quality measures, which we'll outline in the next slide, um, we excluded about 19 submissions in our final analysis. And so, um, I just wanted to please note that the meaningful day numbers do not represent the total of the other three services, but rather the number of providers that actually populated that specific tab. Um, so if you're trying to add the numbers up together, they won't be because there's some overlap um, between the services. Any questions on this? Great. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so on this slide, we're talking through the um, how we decided on which data points to exclude. Um, we did the exclusion in phases. First, we started by removing any of the missing data points or zeros. So if on the tab a provider had submitted um, some information on that tab, but they were missing anything or if they had zeros in there then um, or if any of them were inappropriately populated then we removed them so an example of inappropriately populated section would be um, instead of sharing total wage um, somebody had shared hourly wage uh, and then the we finally used um, the uh, interquartile range to figure out on the spread of our data and using um, the one and a half times the interquartile range to determine where the outliers are, which is a standard statistical um, standard for cutting out outliers. I mean, so just on this tab specifically, I wanted to show the numbers that we removed just based on the statistical criteria. Um, so the last tab had 19 for day half for 2019, for instance, four of those were actually um, considered outliers based on our statistical criteria. Okay, next slide, please. So after the um, same way we calculated transportation last time we talked through, we approached it with the same method, folding in the new um, data that we received post um, deadline and um, going through the process of cleaning the data and removing the outliers. On this slide shows the results of each um, service grouping and for the 2019 data, which is on the left and the projection data, which is on the right. And so um, the transportation component we calculated for our day habilitation, for instance, was 37% for the 2019 data and 47% for what was being projected by providers. Um, we also did various looks at the averages. So for instance, we calculated the weighted average as requested. And we also looked at median and for each of the service groupings, and we found that the results were very similar or fairly close within a few percentage points um, any way we sliced that data. Leslie? So, uh, go ahead. 
Hi, this is Maria. Um, so at the last RAGS meeting, we had talked about um, calculating the transportation component as a percentage of billable wages. Is did you make that um, refinement to the the percentages, or are we seeing are we using total hourly wages? So we're still using total hourly wage, and that's because we have some concerns about using the um, non or using the billable wages only, and that it would, um, in our opinion, be overstating the, the percentage. Okay, and did you do the math to tie back to the GL or the or the uh, the data? Mm -hmm. Because I, I think if you do the math, you you will not tie back to the data. So that was our primary concern that these percentages understate the true transportation costs if you're applying them in the brick. Yeah, this is Chris. Um, so we we looked at this a few different ways, and uh, we realized that there are you know kind of pros and cons to different approaches. Um, from our perspective, we think this is the best way to do it, the most consistent with the way that we've applied the other uh, components. Um, I think, you know, last time we heard that uh, there were some concerns there and, um, you know, that some exhibits may be shared. Um, we didn't see anything uh, that was, you know, compelling in changing that that story. Um, so based on, you know, our interpretation, it seems like this was uh, the most consistent way to use that information. Okay. Well, we did we did share some examples, but um, it may not have gotten to you. So, um, yeah, I, I remain very concerned about the understatement of these percentages. So, and this is Laura. I just want to echo what Maria is saying. I mean, we went through this. Um, you know, we've been through this, and we have concerns. I think that go beyond the transportation data, um, Chris. To your point that you are dealing in similar ways with other components that have similar concerns as transportation. And uh, it just, I mean, this this is a, I can't overstate or understate, I can't say strongly enough how much of a concern this is. So just to say, no, we're not doing this, it it, it is not coming close to addressing the concern. And having walked through the math with Maria, it does not tie back. So I think um, this is significant. And I would, you know, agree with both Laura and Maria's comments. You know, if we're calculating the component on 100% utilization, knowing that we're never going to be billing 100% utilization and we're, we're going out of the gate with the assumption that we're never going to be able to recoup the entire expenditure. And I, I think, again, it's I've mentioned several times, I think we've got some root cause issues that are creating problems within the rate system. And it goes back to some of the fundamental concepts that we're using and how we calculate. But if I have a million dollars in transportation expenses and it's based on an eight-hour day, and I'll never bill an eight-hour day, I'll never get my money. I'll never be able to recoup the expenditure to be able to provide the service appropriately. And the last thing I'll say is, I guess I have an overall question: if if there is, you know, if, if there were, if there was an error, would the department acknowledge that? because what I keep hearing over and over again is we keep raising concerns and the answers we get back aren't full answers. It's just, we looked at it and the answer's no. And I have to tell you for the broad provider community, you know, <laughs> they're sitting there watching this saying, what is the department doing? If there are issues, we don't seem to get to a place in this process where we can have a, a, a true discussion and, and an adjustment if, uh, if there is an error. Chris, can you talk a little more about the analysis that Optimus did share some details of how this conclusion was reached? Sure. So I think, um, you know, maybe it's more broad of a question. Um, I think that uh, to the state's um, benefit, what they're showing in some of these, you know, what we'll get to here is that uh, they've gone out and requested information based on feedback from the RAG 
um, that that data did uh, imply a change uh, may be warranted and they're reacting to that change. So I, I don't think it's necessarily fair to say that every concern is just being shot down. Um, I do think that there are some valid concerns. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, I kind of glossed over a little bit. There are kind of some pros and cons to each approach. Um, I definitely understand, uh, you know, what Chris Parks had mentioned there about having your billable time and having concerns if everything is based off, you know, billable time, but you can't have 100% billable time. And I think that's a more fundamental discussion uh, that's maybe outside of the scope of the transportation that we're really aiming to focus on. Um, and so if that's, you know, again, if that's a major concern, we're happy to have those discussions and find ways that we can make changes um, that, you know, are appropriate. So if that's a major concern there, we can look at doing that for the next rate cycle. Um, I know that there's been, for example, concerns about the fixed and variable costs. And so the state has opted to have another meeting specifically to have a more detailed discussion and have some time around that. Um, but I just want to, you know, make sure that that uh, we are seeing that the state is responding to these requests. Um, they may not always, um, you know, make adjustments, uh, but they are making adjustments um, when they do see that it's appropriate and are trying to facilitate some of those uh, discussions to try to get a better understanding and, and understand where things are on the same page. So um, I think that, you know, that is a reasonable point where, you know, we can talk about how the model uh, structurally is built and whether or not um, billable hours should be used as a denominator or what adjustments may or may not be needed there. Um, but I just would like to acknowledge that I believe that's probably a broader, more detailed discussion and maybe not within the scope of the transportation that we're really focused on at the moment. But Chris, this issue isn't something that just, is just coming up in this meeting. What Chris said is what Maria has been saying. It is the feedback we have provided to the department. And every time there's a discussion in one of these meetings, the answer is, oh, yeah, we can talk about that in another meeting. And we never get down to actually having the discussion. Um, so this is not new and it is significant. Um, and so it is very frustrating when every time we raise it, we're told, oh, sure, we can have another discussion about it and we don't seem to get there. Yeah, I'd also add that I don't, I don't think I heard an answer to Jennifer's question around the Optimus analysis. So to the extent you've done the math and you can demonstrate that you're not losing dollars by this methodology, I guess that's what I would be looking for because we've done the math and we can demonstrate that we're losing that, you know, that the, the rates are inadequate um, based on this percentage. So I guess I'd, I'd be interested in seeing the analysis that you've done, um, you know, and, and I, I didn't hear um, any explanation of, of how you arrived at your conclusion. Sure. So um, I I don't have an exhibit, uh, you know, ready to share. If that's something we'd like to walk through in more detail at, at a later date, you know, we can certainly do that. Um, in essence, uh, there are um, various components uh, within the um, within the rate development uh, that may be a um, subset of that billable wage uh, that are being added on to the, uh, the wage that's put in as a base. And so when um, we're looking at adding a, an additional component here, um, we think that by going from the total wage to the base or to the billable wage as a denominator, we're essentially double counting some of those um, adjustments. Now, I understand there is uh, to the you know, point that Chris is making, and I understand you know, when you're talking about trying to do the math and tie everything back, there is some concern about kind of that uh, billable versus global time. Um, I think that the way that the model is developed, uh, it doesn't necessarily have a 100% clean match um, so I think that we've looked at this a couple different ways and we, we feel that there may be some double counting if you're uh, using just the billable as a base because of the other components that are also built in there. However, um, if we limit to uh, just the total hours, there may be uh, some factor that we are you know, potentially missing there that I think is worth investigating a little bit further. 
I, I guess I'd like to see your math. Um, I, I think that would be helpful because, and, and we certainly, you know, have shared our, our, our comparisons and, and can show our math, but I don't think there's any double counting. You can only, you know, bill, <laughs> you know, you're limited in what you can bill and the hours that you can bill and you cannot bill for transportation. So, um, so it has to be baked into the, into the rate um, in terms of the billable wages and hours. So, um, yeah, I think it would be helpful to see see a, a demonstrated illustration of why you think it, there's double counting because I, as an actuary, don't see it. And in fact, I feel like you're underfunding um, these components. So why Chris, don't Chris, we... I, I would second, I would, say I would second Maria's point there. I mean, at, at some point we're duplicative, we've heard double counting, show us because i don't i don't see it i know maria doesn't see it i don't think you know there's a lot of people don't see it show us where you guys are saying that because obviously we're not on the same page and it goes back to the the fixed versus variable and whether we use the uh the, the billable time or the non-billable time as the, as the denominator in that calculation it's all kind of tied together the answer has been when when we do it our way it's duplicative there's there's double counting you do it your way it's not we don't see it somebody's got to show it to us and the last thing I'll add is we're ready to show you our math at any time. And we could show we could have shown it today. We can we we are prepared at any point to show our issues, but we continue to ask questions and not be able to get answers as to why you have actual concerns. Why don't we um thanks for for the optimists and hilltop team, why don't we take this back and have some internal discussion and see if there are um, exhibits we could prepare to distribute to the group to kind of explain this more and address some of these concerns. That would be helpful. Well, Jennifer, the one thing I would say is uh, it would be nice if there could be an actual discussion and not just a, we'll show you why you're wrong. We would like to know what your concerns are. We'd also like to know that our concerns are being heard and that there is an actual discussion about whether there is a path forward and what's causing the discrepancy in the viewpoints. So we are scheduling an extra meeting to talk about fixed and variable costs. Uh, I have a feeling that's probably going to take that entire hour. Um, not by any means shutting down discussion on this, but we may have to um, and make it one of our issues that we dive into more um, in our next cycle. That's certainly something we can do, um, but to tee that up, um, I think it would still be helpful if we work on preparing some more exhibits to uh, address some of these concerns. This is Scott Hollingsworth, and certainly some of this is over my head. Um, I believe the bylaws have room for subgroups, subcommittees. I mean, it would seem like Maria and, and Chris Parks and, and Laura and, and, and some of the folks from Optimus could take a subgroup and really talk about this and get into this. Um, and, and again, not just do a show and tell, but you know, make a subgroup like our, I think our bylaws allow, allow you to do and dig into it. I do. Uh, certainly yeah. as a provider, it gives me a lot of pause. That's also a suggestion we can we can take back. It might be an issue that is uh, good for a subgroup. And just for the record, I believe that suggestion was made at the last RAG meeting, so I don't think this is something new. And I just want to point out that the more we punt the substantive discussions, the 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 more providers have difficulty in. Um, making the transition to LTSS. I know that DBA and Medicaid are anxious for providers to make that transition. And because all of these things go together, the longer it takes to, to address this issue, the more that transition is affected. So, I mean, I think- Laura, you, I would, the, I would, oh, Go ahead, go ahead. I was just, I, I'd second that as well. So I think a lot of providers are are taking the wait and see approach. 
you know, we're going to see if this thing gets fixed because they don't believe the rate system is correct, at least with specific to the issues we're talking about here. And, and they're going to, you're going to have to shove them into LTSS. You're going to have to mandate that they go in because they're not going to go in voluntarily until they absolutely have to. So, I mean, I do want to be clear that I, we aren't hunting issues for the next meeting so much as we decided on our list of issues for the year. Um, we're reaching conclusions on those issues at this time of year. And clearly this is something that's still causing concern. So we will um, absolutely revisit it. Um, but I think um there's more to share here and we can certainly come back to this today um if there are still concerns after um we talk about the changes that the state is recommending um related to transportation and thanks if we go to the next slide So just again, based on the data and the conversations we've had, we had some key takeaways about transportation. Um, we do believe that we have a robust sample um, of information that we can use to, to start making adjustments. Um, as we saw in the results from the data, we acknowledge the transportation data is higher in what's showing in 2019 and what providers are projecting. Um, than what's currently built into the rate model. Um, and so again, we looked at the median and the mean, excluding outliers, and as we mentioned in the prior slide, um, we got to the similar results. And so we feel um, that this, the, what the data is showing is fairly consistent with what the narrative has been. Um, and then of course we know providers are projecting an increase um, to the component itself with increased costs and gas and other concerns about um, inflation. So as we were having internal discussions, some of the adjust um, considerations we were making for any kind of adjustment um, is that we wanted to use the projections as guidance. Um, and we know that projections were not actual data but it does give us insight into what providers believe to be the reality of service costs um, moving forward. Um, we're also able to understand the direction and magnitude of the expected increases and the rationale of providers that um, share their perspective on the perceived growth. So having the projected data, although not actual data, was very helpful in giving us direction on where things are expected to go. Um, we, of course, considered the increased costs um, that have occurred since 2019. Um, and then we wanted to review these services on a service specific basis, meaning not all services are going to be equally impacted. Um, and we really, and we're not just blanketing one adjustment across everything. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we'll talk through the staffing ratio um, data next, and then we'll talk through what um, resulted from the internal discussions. Leslie, before you move to staffing ratios, I have one question around the mean. Yeah. Are you using, I know we asked last time you were showing straight averages, um, and we talked about weighted averages. Are you using a weighted average or straight average when you do your calculation for the transportation percentage? Sure. So that's what um, I had mentioned was we were we had looked at it various ways because of that request from last time. Um, we're showing straight averages still just because that's the way that it was calculated in the work model. But um, we had looked at the uh, weighted average amongst providers and we also looked at the median. Um, when we looked at the spread of data and we got to very similar um, or comparable percentages, it's within one or 2% um, for e any of the ways we sliced it. So I'm sorry, the median is different than the mean. So, so you're saying the mean was, is a straight mean um, and, and the weighted average mean is similar within 2%? Yeah. Okay. 
Yes, and I understand the median is different. We're just saying that we, we looked at it a lot of different ways and we got to similar results in any of the ways that we looked at it, including the um, weighted average as you had requested. Okay, thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it to Chris to talk about the staffing ratio. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, so what we had done for the staffing ratio was looked at it um, a similar way. Uh, so we're trying to be consistent, you know, across our approach here, um, regardless of what specific adjustment we may be making. Uh, so on this slide, you know, we're showing essentially the same kind of information here, uh, the number of submissions based on the information uh, that was populated for the day habilitation and community development services for the staffing ratio information. So similar to transportation, we did the exclusions and phases. So first we removed any missing data, missing data or zeros, um, then uh, any tabs that had you know, potentially inappropriately populated data, and finally used that 1.5 times inner quartile range to determine the outliers. Uh, there is one additional layer that we added to the staffing ratio, uh, which is the split of small group versus large group in, in day. Um, you may recall in our initial uh, proposal for data collection, we had uh, sought we sought to delineate between small group and large group and one on one and two on one. Uh, what we heard feedback around was that that is not um, information that providers would be able to share, um, and so we understand that this is not uh, necessarily a complete correlation uh, between what data pr was provided and uh, whether or not they match those exact group sizes. Uh, but just uh, to provide some additional context, we did see uh, clusters appear in the data that you know it was very common to have a staffing ratio of about three and another kind of cluster appeared that it was very common to have a staffing ratio of about six. Um, and so we, we made those uh, groupings um, for this review uh, based on the service definitions, um, you know, within whatever limitations are available on the service definitions. So the table uh, here shows the number of tabs for each service that were excluded based on that criteria. On the next slide, we have the results of the calculated average group sizes for the 2019 data on the left uh, and the projection estimates in yellow on the right for each section. Um, and we're folding in the additional data we received after the original submission deadline. So again, you know, we're making assumptions around group sizing based on the service definitions uh, due to the limitations of that data collection process. And just like Leslie mentioned, uh, for the transportation component, we looked at this a number of different ways. Um, you know, there's uh, a phrase that is something like, you know, you if you torture data enough, you can get it to say anything you want. And the idea here is we tried to play around looking at, you know, including or excluding various um, ranges. We tried looking at weighted averages. We tried looking at straight averages and medians. And uh, ultimately, we were getting to very similar results um, within, you know, a couple tenths uh, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, overall for the staffing ratio for each component. Um, so this is fairly consistent um, how we're uh, how we're showing this versus you know how it came through um, as the data. So uh, I'll just point out on this slide, um, and we'll see this again on the next slide as well. Uh, the yellow bars are all at or slightly above the blue bars, meaning the projections uh, were slightly higher than the. Um, staffing ratios that existed in the data, uh, but they were very consistent uh, or very close to the actual data. So on the next slide, we have some of those numbers that you can actually see there. Um, and so for example, we have that day habilitation to, uh, and we did up to five, and then we split it. Um, the next section was anything above five. Um, we did look at doing this. I know there was a discussion about two up to six, um, and that would uh, essentially pull the higher ratios into the small group, and that would remove the lower ratios from the large group. Uh, so what that means ultimately is that that would make both of those groups look even higher. 
Um, so this is kind of being a little bit more conservative, going with the lower estimates. Uh, and so this compares what we have to what's built in the rate model. Um, the staffing ratios based on the 2019 are again coming in around or slightly higher than what's currently built into the model. Uh, the projection estimates, like I mentioned, are coming in a little bit higher than the 2019, 2019 data. This is due to a noticeable shift towards smaller groups. Uh, smaller group providers are projecting uh, will occur in this upcoming fiscal year where providers average staffing ratio is shifting to less than five. So we're seeing uh, more providers in the projection move to a small group kind of setting. Uh, but within small group and large group, at least the way that we've categorized them here, those averages are increasing. Uh, so we're not proposing making any adjustments here. Um, this is, you know, uh, relatively consistent with what's in the model, but there are also uh, some, you know, additional kind of concerns around how this is, you know, applicable to exactly what we're looking for. Uh, so on the next slide, we can kind of talk through some of the interpretation there. Um, so just to get into some of the details, um, we want to just pop over to the next slide there. Uh, we've talked through some of the observations. Um, so we, we do have a pretty good sample size here, uh, but like we mentioned, there's limitations of the data that we're able to correct collect around staffing ratios. Um, and so, you know, as we move forward and we're trying to collect, uh, you know, data where we can ask providers ahead of time uh, what we're looking to collect, um, or, you know, as providers are transitioning into these services, we may be able to get a little bit more uh, detailed data by the categories that we're looking for. Um, so, Again, uh, you know, we had the aggregated data and we saw those providers clustered around uh, an average of three and an average of six, which, um, you know, correlated pretty well to our expectations around small group and large group. And that's not to say that they, uh, that, you know, clearly supports that, but it, it does seem to indicate that, you know, there may be some, uh, some similarity there. Um, and again, you know, just like we did with the, uh, transportation data, we were looking at what the projections were showing to see, you know, is this something that is likely to change going forward? And what we were seeing is that they were staying relatively static, if anything, kind of going up. Um, so we didn't want to make an adjustment there to increase the staff ratio because, you know, that wasn't really uh, something that was data driven and it wasn't moving that much. And we understand there are some concerns about the staffing ratios being too high. So I don't think that's something a direction that we wanted to take there. Um, so we had some internal discussions about the results and what adjustments could be made to the meaningful day rates. Uh, so just before we swap over to that, um, are there questions or comments around uh, some of the data information here with regards to the staffing ratios? Chris, this is Maria. Um, I guess a question on the CDS. Did you cap the CDS data, you know, or, or remove outliers, you know, that were well clearly just wrong, especially on the on the upper bound? Because I think we commented last time how it was surprising that staffing ratio for CDS was so high. It doesn't look like it moved. So I was wondering what your outlier criteria was for CDS. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, we use the same criteria that we were discussing. We did the 1.5 uh, times the interquartile range, um, you know, above and below the 75th and 25th percentile. Uh, so we did uh, see that there were some, you know, outliers uh, more on maybe the CDS side that um, I think there there's potential for, you know, how this information is collected. Um, Again, you know, we're kind of limited by the data that we have. Uh, so there could be some, you know, movement around, uh, you know, one, um, one uh, DSP taking care of different folks at different times, things like that. Um, so we didn't want to make, you know, too many assumptions about this uh, telling us exactly what we think it's going to tell us. Uh, but we did, for your question in particular, we did use the same methodology. We used that 1.5 times the IQR. Um, and I believe we excluded some higher staff ratios because of that. Okay. But you said you looked at it lots of different ways. So if you 
didn't um, do the interquartile range because I, I guess <laughs> in my mind you're, you might be throwing out some perfectly valid data points based on that criteria but then there's some clearly you know at the upper bound you know some things that are just outside of the definition of what's a small group in cds so so you know that the maximum shouldn't be higher than four um so that's where i'm i'm a little confused as to how you how you got to the averages knowing the definitions of what is a small group in cds Sure. So I believe, um, you know, again, with the definitions there, we were trying to um, make accommodations to the uh, to correlate to the service definitions. So for CDS, um, I believe anything that was five or above was excluded. Uh, you know, if that's helpful, we can go back and, and confirm. Um, so there were, you know, quite a few providers uh, under that range that are getting to this uh, w this average here that we're showing, uh, but I believe um, you know since the criteria was uh, is up to four, you know we we start at five and anything above that we remove for this final look. Uh, but if that's again if that's useful information, we can provide um, uh, you know follow up there. Chris, it's Laura. When you say you started at five. Did, if something was between four and five, did you include it? Um, you know, off the top of my head, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, that's something if, you know, if it's helpful, we can take a look back at that and uh, see what that was, that specific step was and, you know, provide that. Because again, we raised this last month, this very, this exact same issue. CDS is capped, it can't be a group larger than four. So anything above four is clearly should not be included. Right. So it's odd Chris, to I me think, that I think you have a... Draw the, so I think you've got to draw the line again like you did on the day have. It, it's through four inclusive and then anything above four is going to have to be excluded. It's outside the uh, uh, regulations. So if you've got 4.1, 4.2, 4.5 in there, I, I don't, and I think you have to because I don't see how else you're gonna end up at 3.9 because there's a bunch of providers that are providing CDS in one to two, one to three. So it, it, for it to end at 3.9, there's gotta be something to pull it north uh, towards four. And the only thing that's gonna do that is something over four. Um, I just wanted to correct um, one to 2.9, but um, we definitely understand your point and um, we'll go back and review to make sure. Leslie, what did you mean by one to two point nine? Um, for the twenty nineteen data that's showing, or were you talking about the projection average? Can you can you pop back? I think it's back one screen. Yeah, we're talking the projection average. You're saying that should be one to two point nine. We're talking about the projection should be one to three. It's right now it says one to three point nine. Is that what we're talking about? That's what I'm talking about. Oh, I apologize then. I'm, uh, I was looking at the 2019 number that we calculated. So, I mean, our, our main point is is the projection average at 1 to 3.9, knowing that the regulation is at 4, 4 inclusive, but above 4. I, I don't, you know, seeing the providers, the new providers are doing 1 to 2, 1 to 3. I don't see how it gets pulled to 1 to 3.9 unless you've got data pulling it that you're including that's above 4. That or everybody's at 3.9. Yeah, so we can, two providers. So. we can uh, go back and, and uh, provide additional detail around that. Um, we did use the same criteria for looking at both the data and the projection. Um, so to the extent uh, that we are seeing that, you know, we can uh, take a look if we're, you know, including things over four and, and see what the difference is. Um, again, you know, we looked at this a variety of different ways and I don't have all the different options off the, you know, at my fingertips, but we were getting to similar results. So, you know, it's potential that that 3.9 does include something that's like, you know, 4.5 in there. Um, however, when we looked at it in various ways, you know, 
excluding those, I think, you know, maybe it was something more along the lines of, of three and a half or 3.2, something like that in the projection. Uh, but at any rate, um, I think every way that we looked at it was above the data uh, and above the model assumption. Uh, but it sounds like that is um, a concern for several of you. So I think it might be helpful if we are able to, you know, take a second look at what we did and provide in writing uh, the specific cutoffs and if it was, uh, you know, anything above four, what that might look like. I think Thank that's you, Chris. helpful, think Chris. Is... But can I just, can I just, I'm sorry, Chris. Can I just say, this is just another example of something we we talked so specifically about this and yet here we are another month gone by and we are having the exact same discussion the same question the same response and you know this process is not going to work if we don't act on the discussion that happens in a month and move forward it's just this exact issue of what was the cutoff for cbs is exactly what we discussed last month so I don't know what it will take to make this shift, but this is incredibly frustrating. And I was just gonna say, I mean, I, I think this is where we're asking for the transparency and asking for the ability to be able to see the data because there's things that we're gonna look at that we're gonna go like, nope, that doesn't belong there. And, and you know, we can move forward quickly rather than you go back, review, come back, go back, review, come back. I mean at some point, I think it would be very beneficial for us to see, you know, actual data and for, you know, full disclosure, full transparency for things to be on the table. And if it needs to be done in a subgroup, if it needs to be done with provider permission so we can share data and see the data, I would venture to say that most of the providers would want us to look at that data and give our input on it. It's why we're on the group. So, uh, yeah, I hear that feedback. Um, we, uh, you know, did respond based on some of the suggestions last time. I think we were specifically talking about dehabilitation, whether the cutoff should be six or five. And so, uh, you know, that is something that we took several looks at. Um, you know, we can provide that additional context on the CDS. And I just want to reiterate uh, what we brought up um, again at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, there are some concerns about the state uh, potentially sharing back that data, but that is something that um is certainly the providers are able to share that information among themselves um and so i think that that comment around you know requesting uh that providers potentially also uh, are asked about sharing with the reg that's something that can be considered um because i you know i i understand i like to be able to look at the data and see it every way that i can as well uh, but we just want to make sure that we are um, being responsible to uh, the providers and the individuals uh, that we are sharing their data appropriately um so uh we did kind of look at these a few different ways um like i mentioned and uh got to some kind of results here about how we wanted to move forward um so i think uh, if we can i'll turn that over to robert to talk through some of the decisions Yes. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, could you just go back up to the one more? So the our our current rate. Right, just I want to make sure we're we're all on the same page. It is not based on the 2019 template data average nor the projection average, but on the one to 1.5. I, I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page uh, regarding that. Um, thank you. If you wanted to go ahead, Chris, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Trisha, and jump to slide 14. All right. So, you know, we've had several internal discussions, and based on those discussions, we are proposing to maintain uh, the, the current staffing level assumptions. Um, that are you know driving the current rates. Uh, the data for staffing ratios is not compelling enough at this time uh, to make any adjustments, and so we'll continue to monitor uh, emergent experiences. Uh, we received some feedback here today regarding uh, 
CDS that, that we'll discuss at our next internal meeting. Um, however, you know, based on the 2019 data and projected estimates, we do feel that the transportation data was compelling enough to warrant an adjustment uh, to the transportation component. And so after discussing options internally and taking into consideration everything that has been shared and discussed, you know, we're proposing to use the 2019 data kind of as a starting point and making adjustments for any expected program changes, policy goals, and considerations for the observed growth being presented in the projections. Um, and so are there any questions regarding that? Uh, any, any points for discussion before we, um, before I turn it back over to Chris to get into um, what that will look, would look like? Robert, it's, it's Chris Parks. Just a, a quick question. You know, if you're going to use 2019 as a starting point, what was the uh, the process for review and, and led to the decision to use the 2019 versus uh, the 2022 projected? You know what I mean? Again, we've, got, we've come from 2014 to 2019, certainly an improvement, but we've got 2022. I know it's a projection, but I think they're probably pretty realistic projections considering the uh, situation. What, what was the, I guess, what was the reason for choosing 2019 over the 2022 projector? Sure, I don't want to rain on Chris's parade and, and he'll get, get into that. Um, what we didn't want to do is, is, is over project, right? And then once the actual data started to come in, now we're adjusting the percentages downward, but he'll, he'll get into, you know, the methodology that we used um, uh, to get us somewhere between 2019 and what was projected. Chris? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, essentially, when you're doing rate development, the idea is that, you know, you want to collect some data that that represents the historical period and that uh, you understand that the future will not match exactly to the historical periods you want to adjust for uh, what you think is likely to occur. So uh, just for context, um, you know, if we're looking at that next slide. Uh, we do have um, for each of those three services, we have in that first column, uh, the, we have the transportation averages that were calculated based on the 2019 data. So you can see for day habilitation, for example, is the 37%. Um, and so that's the 2019 historical period. Uh, in the second column, we have the program change adjustment factor that we're uh, proposing. So you can see, um, and what was mentioned earlier, uh, each service grouping is considered separately. There's not one blanket adjustment applied across the board, uh, you know, taking into account the projected growth, consideration of the intended service structure and increased costs, um, you know, and this is really informed by those projections. So I don't wanna have the, the idea here that we're just waving away uh, projections that was very informative. And as a result of that uh, review, the 2019 data is being adjusted uh, similar to a similar level as the projections. Um, so that 37% has a 25% adjustment to it, uh, which would result in um, a 46%, 46.3% uh, transportation component for the day habilitation rates. Um, just wanted to point out again, this is the component of the brick. So a 1% increase on the trans transportation component does not directly translate to 1% on the full rate. Uh, so in the next few slides, we'll show what those resulting rates uh, should, you know, would be if the proposed adjustments are approved and uh, go through the budget. Um, again, we're showing, we'll be talking through those fully funded rates. Uh, it might be adjusted based on the funding percentage, similar to what happened this cycle due, due to budget constraints. Uh, but we feel that this adjustment was warranted based on the data, um, and we want to try to get these uh, get these right. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll kind of show what that proposed impact would be um, for both the standard and the geographic differential day habilitation rates. So the proposed adjustment is to increase the transportation component uh, for day habilitation from 28.7%, which was what was built into the rates, uh, you may recall on the previous slide uh, that we had a 37% data, um, and then with that projection uh, that got bumped up to 46.3%. Uh, so this 
uh, once that gets you know flows through completely uh, again that 46.3% um, is almost you know or is about an 18% increase on the transportation component alone uh, but when we put that through to the entire rate that uh, is closer to you know just about an 8% increase to the rates for day habilitation uh, the adjusted rates shown in this table again are fully funded rates and we want you to Keep in mind that these rates are subject to the funding percentages dependent upon the budget process um, and nothing has been finalized around that yet. Um, so we have, uh, you know, the next slide looks at the CDS rates. Um, the proposed adjustment is to increase the transportation from 34% uh, approximately to 43%, uh, which is a little over a 4% increase overall to the rates for CDS. Uh, the adjusted rates shown in this table are fully funded rates and keep in mind again rates are subject to that funding percentage um, so just pause there for a second see if there's any questions on day habilitation or cds chris this is maria if you go back to slide 15 where you show the program change impact can you explain how you came up with those factors and, and why they vary so much by service? Sure, so those um, are based on uh, state uh, assumptions uh, that are informed by the projections. So um, I believe the intent there is to approximate what those projections are expected to look like um, and use that to account for the change from the historical period to the projected period uh, so i don't those numbers aren't necessarily calculated uh, from a specific set of numbers um, however they are the best estimates from the state on what they think is likely to incur uh, and again those are informed by the projections and so they vary uh, based on information that was received from providers so we saw for example day habilitation the projections looked significantly higher than what was already uh, established in the data versus cds uh, i believe those projections were much narrower uh, relative to the data that was uh, shown in the experience i see okay so they're just so you're really just using the data and and making some modifications um based on some <laughs> some set of assumptions i suppose i i just scott i i matched that i thought with the rate analysis the transportation component and it says poly policy decision 150 percent but that that's not where you meant uh, i guess day habilitation has 125 percent of poly dis policy decision cds has 150 but so I was mapping that, matching that. But am I incorrect in looking at that in the in the brick methodology? Um, so the anything that was in the brick prior to this uh, would have been assumptions that had already been made uh, around how the transportation may be higher than what the data uh, shown previously uh, had indicated. So uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head on CDS if that's something that previously, you know, had a 150% increase relative to the day the data that were uh, used in development of that. This would replace that, and so this has a a new data starting point um, and a new adjustment factor. Um, and so ultimately, what we end up with uh, for CDS, I believe, is going from a 34%. Uh, up to a 43%. So that 34% may have reflected, for example, 150% of the prior data. And the 43% indicates, uh, you know, it represents the new data with the new assumption. And so ultimately that is um, roughly a 9% increase to that component or roughly about a 4% increase to the rates. Does that help to clarify? No, I was talking about the uh, adjustment factor. But um, I, I, I must have misinterpreted it. It said 125% for, for day habilitation as a policy decision in, in the break, and I thought you were multiplying that because um, you've got the 125% there. Um, CBS has 150% in, in that policy decision. Uh, so, 
back to that slide. Would it help if we went back to that slide? For the for, for the adjustment factor, I didn't. I can guess. I have it up. I didn't see that adjustment factor. Yeah. So for slide. yes, what we're showing here is a, a five percent adjustment factor, um, and so that's right. Forty one percent is multiplied by one hundred five percent. Sure, I understand that. All righty. Okay, so if we uh, move along to, uh, I believe it's slide 18, we'll get to the employment services rates uh, for just just showing the standard rates on this one uh, for illustrative purposes. Um, the proposed adjustment is to increase the transportation component from 41% across all these employment services um, from 18% uh, to started out anywhere between 18% to 22%, depending on the service. Um, so depending on the service, you know, that impact can vary a little bit and we're seeing around uh, eight and a half to a little over 12% increase depending on the specific service and how that change would be adjusted. Um, on the next slide, we're showing essentially the same thing, uh, getting to a similar impact there for the geographic differential rates. Um, so uh, again, uh, throw this out for any questions um, or comments or thoughts around these adjustments. You know, again, we're, we're trying to react to questions and input from the RAG, uh, collect that data and make adjustments as warranted here. Um, and so this is uh, what we're proposing. Um, and then I think uh, Jennifer can walk through the next steps, but just wanted to pause for a minute and see if there's any questions or comments or thoughts there. I think this will get back into the, I know we're gonna have a follow-up on the fixed and variable um, conversation, but but you know, we did um, think about proposing some options, especially on the, on the day for the small group, large group, where you vary this percentage um, to recognize that, for example, transportation, you're, you're transporting participants um, and you know, the more, the more people in your group, the, the more your transportation costs should go up. So, um, so I know that there's a follow-up discussion on the fixed and variable um, percentage, and then of course, I, you know, I still, you know, just want to reiterate, I don't think these percentages are correct. So I, I hope that that we'll be able to um, make the correction on using a, a different denominator to adjust these percentages. Yeah, um, we're, we're happy to have those discussions. I think it will be helpful uh, specifically around the fixed variable um, to get to a common ground there. Um, and I think it it's, uh, probably would be helpful as well to have a, a better um, understanding and, and common, you know, common view of how uh, these adjustments should or uh, shouldn't be applied with regard to the billable time uh, versus uh, just total time. So I think those those are some great points. Um, it sounds like we'll have some opportunities to get into the details there. Okay, and why don't we go to the next slide? Um, so thank you to the Optimist team. Um, as previously mentioned, the overall fiscal impact of the recommended adjustments will be subject to the limitations of the state budget. Um, the governor's recommended budget will be released in January 2023. Um, specifically, because we'll have a newly elected governor later this year, um, the budget must be submitted no later than 10 days following the convening of the General Assembly. Uh, the legislative session this year begins January 11th, 2023. Um, before we talk about additional next steps, um, I'd like to use some of our remaining time um, to hear reflections from members, um, issues that you're still concerned about, overall feedback. Um, really want this to be part of a conversation, kind of how you would like to 
see this group evolve. Jennifer, it's Laura. Uh, well, I appreciate the question. Um, I think we've raised some of our um, concerns along the way um, about how um, the process is going and concerns we have. Um, and I also think um, we'll, we'll um, take some time to, at least from the Mac's perspective, and think about it and um, give you some feedback in writing. Sure. I mean, and I definitely appreciate everyone's patience as kind of we we learn this process. Um, and while we have done a process like this for other providers with every provider group, it's there are new things to learn, um, new concerns that are specific to specific services. So, um, okay learning as we go and definitely want to hear your feedback. Robert, do you have any closing remarks before we continue on with next steps? Sure. No, I, I agree um, with, with your assessment, Jennifer. Um, this has been um, a learning experience uh, for all of us as we uh, going through this uh, initial year of this process. And, you know, we, we greatly do appreciate any feedback that you can share with us. We want to make it um, a good process. I know that the, the MCO process has been uh, ongoing for quite some time, um, but, you know, uh, I know there will also hit some bumps in the road along the way, but I think, you know, we just need to, to learn from them and and um, uh, really get a, get to a point where you know we're we're obviously not going <clears> to <throat> agree on everything, uh, but I do think we should you know work towards a goal of at least getting to agree to disagree and, and, and understand uh, the why for for the different positions, and I I, I think we'll get there um, eventually. So thank you all, and uh, this is. Uh, um, Turn it back over to you, Jennifer, to, to close this out. Um, but it, it seems like this this process uh, for this first year has flown by. And uh, know that we have one additional meeting uh, to discuss, you know, the fixed and variable issue. But but I'm I'm really looking forward to, to the the next process and implementing some of the improvements to to that process. That uh, based on your feedback and based on some of our internal discussions. Thanks. Hi, uh, this is Tom Hollingsworth, and it's it's always hard for me to. I'm, Robert, I'm not a quick, think, quick thinker. Um, but um, if, if if I can, I, I want to you know appreciate that we are talking about fixed variable. I appreciate that we looked at uh, transportation. I appreciate that there was listening um, on issues that were raised. Those are the positive things that I would say, and that, and that I appreciate it. Um, I, I don't feel like it's been collaborative. Um, I, I feel like it's been a little bit more of a show and tell. Um, and and I don't know, going forward in, 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 in future times, if there's a way to make it more of a collaborative effort and analysis, I think that would, that would help me as a provider feel like my time involved and, 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 and representing a provider organizations, you know, as, as, as one of the providers, I would feel like my time was more valuably spent. Um, again, I appreciate some of the, 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 the listening, but if it could be more collaborative, and I think a lot of these points were raised today. So that, that would be my real quick <laughs> response to the question. Thank you very much. And of course, this Robert, isn't the, the only opportunity to give feedback. If there are other things that you think of at other times, you can always reach out. Um, I think, Chris, you were going to say something? Yeah, I just, I, I think, you know, when the charter was originally set up, the, the creation of subgroups, you know, I think there's value there. And I think we need to look at that portion of the process and see how we can better utilize the time between meetings to research, to do some analysis, to come back with feedback and, and start to make things happen quicker. 
uh, you know, we get to a rebase year and we're moving at the pace that we're moving now, you know, the back and forth, the level of things that we're going to need to accomplish is going to be significantly greater than I think that what we've uh, been able to accomplish so far in this first year. The mechanism's there. I just think we need to figure out how to use it as, as efficiently as possible. Yeah, I think you make a very good point there. Um, the, more, the more I personally think about it, the more I think subgroups could be a way that we could do some of these deeper dives and um, kind of get through more of these topics in between meetings and kind of maybe make a, a different use of the full reg meeting times. Yeah, I think looking at subgroups is definitely something I'm thinking about um, for the next cycle, for sure. Any this other? is Scott again. Jennifer, you mentioned oh, sure. you can you mentioned that feedback. You know, I can always give feedback, but I don't I don't understand the process for giving feedback. And and mm -hmm. maybe that's something we could look forward to in the future. Is 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 there a listserv? Is there some way that some of this could be I'm I'm it's we're all so busy, it'd be hard to deal with all of that. But the reality yeah. of me being able to give feedback, I'm not so sure that I feel that. We can work on kind of refining that for sure. And I think we have some language about that in the charter, but if there's a way we can make it more systematic, we can definitely look at that. Any other thoughts or comments? Jennifer, it's Laura. Just to, just for clarity's sake. The last meeting of this cycle will be the meeting in September to discuss um, fixed versus variable or shared versus non-shared costs. There won't be another. There won't be another September. There was discussion that there might be a September meeting. So you're saying that the the last one will be the standalone meeting. The the September fixed variable costs, at least as far as I currently understand, it would be our last meeting of this cycle. I guess I, I would have a question. Well, I, and maybe that meeting can address, you know, those significant concerns. I didn't know if there would need to be another one after that, but maybe that one will be enough to do that. You know, say if that's our last <laughs> meeting and we've only Got it for an hour. I think we may need to consider how much content we would need to cover in that hour. If we're doing fixed variable, we're talking potentially about the billable versus right. non billable, and then just how do we move forward? That's a lot to jam into an hour. Yeah, I mean, my my thought is that we should take that hour primarily with um, fixed and variable because I mean, I think there's probably enough there to use that hour. Uh, as far as billable and non-billable, we can take that back. Um, I think at the very least, um, we can provide you some more exhibits, um, but we'll we'll follow up with um, kind of our plan going forward with that as well. I think the doodle poll said next that that meeting was an extra meeting for an hour. That's the way I interpret the, it. Not that I really want another meeting. <laughs> yeah, the, the fixed and variable costs, right? Because we originally were not contemplating um, having a September meeting, but um, the fixed and variable cost issue that seems to be very important to members. Um, and we wanted to make sure uh, we gave it a full discussion and conversation. So that's why it was added to the calendar. But I think to, to keep that meeting um, focused, the, the scope of that meeting focused on fixed and variable, um, we can consider, you know, addressing the billable, non-billable issue um, to, you know, through a subcommittee, which is allowable by the charter. So 
I haven't ruled that out, Chris. Uh, it's just we we can have those discussions internally. Robert, I would just say I would I would hate to see the cycle end without having some kind of dis, uh, discussion about the billable versus non billable as the denominator. Um, because it really is significant. So however you all want to do that, but I would just really recommend that it not um, wait until the next cycle starts. I think we need to deal with that sooner rather than later. Well, maybe a, as a follow up to the issue about subgroups, you know, if we're outside the cycle or between cycles, can subgroups still do some work during that time period? I just, we've got so much going on, so much to do, so much to accomplish, and we're gonna take a four month break. And you know, I'm, I'm certainly willing to continue to do work. So I don't think there's anything that says subgroups can't work in between. So that's something we can keep in mind too, as we um, plan our work for the next few months. Any other comments or questions? We still have some time. Okay. Um, during, do, okay. Sorry, Jennifer. During the conversation, um, Laura and Maria, um, you all said you had presented to the state examples of um, the billable hours versus total hours um, math. That's right. Yeah, Robert has those. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, any other questions or comments? Is, is there a... Um... And, and maybe in other minutes, priorities for uh, remaining provider priorities for FY24. Are there any other any, anything any, any anything else that, that that is a priority to consider? So I think at this point, um, I mean the where where we are in the budget cycle, we've kind of reached kind of the the time when we need to finalize our adjustments. I think we had the, the discussion about priorities kind of at the beginning of the cycle. Um, but of course, this doesn't foreclose if other things come up in the interim um, of talking about potential changes that might be needed to be made to 24 um, in the next cycle. With the MCO rate setting process, we do have a mid-year adjustment process as well. Um, so I wouldn't say, I, mean, I would say um, for the governor's budget request that's going in in January, we're kind of, we're at the point where we can't take on more priorities, but um, there will be, there could be other opportunities if we need to talk about we need to prioritize other changes to FY24 that we could do that. Um, we can talk about that at the beginning of the next cycle. Jennifer, one last question for you. We had talked about the data collection tool coming out. I think you said maybe in the next week or so, and then 30 days of potential feedback. When would we have a follow-up conversation on that if we're not including that in the 16th? So I will have to have some conversations with Hilltop, um, unless Cynthia, you have some thoughts on um, and as more detail on your, your thoughts about how um, the template will be testing the template before the next cycle starts. 
Yeah, what we had discussed was working with the pilot group all through the fall. And then at the January RAG meeting, coming back to all of you and saying, here is the template. We've, we've made tweaks to it based on our pilot testing. Here's how it all went. Here's the provider's reaction. And then hopefully from there, <clears throat> we can take it and move into um, the process between January of June of preparing the providers with technical assistance to start completing the template starting July 1st of 23. Although, Chris, I think I get the point that you were trying that I think you were trying to make about um, if we're letting you see the template now, is there a mechanism for immediate feedback before that January um, potential meeting? So we can take that back yeah, it, as well. Exactly. I think there may be, I mean, there may be value. I mean, if, if you're going to give us the template to eyeball and kind of give you some feedback on it, there may be value in having a conversation if there's any concerns or, or ideas or concepts that may make it, you know, more efficient for everybody that we do that before maybe it's launched to the, uh, the pilot group that's going to, that's going to work on it between now and, and January. Right, we can definitely we can take that back. I think at the very least we could do a Google form and then if if you document the Google form warrants it, we can we can talk about other potential steps. Um quick Thank question you. for for Laura and, and Maria. I, I just want to make sure are, that you're referring to the presentation that I received yesterday and, and that there wasn't something that I was supposed to have received prior to that regarding the uh, billable, non billable math. That's what I was referring to. Yes. Okay. All right. But I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if Laura had, had sent along anything else. No, that was it. Okay. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, so thank you everyone truly for um, sharing all your feedback. Um, it, it is incredibly helpful and um, really do appreciate how, how committed you all are to this program and how engaged um, you have been um, and wanting to provide feedback throughout this process. Um, really want to recognize the work and contribution of all of you um, throughout the year, especially as we've been trying to stand up this new structure. Um, as we saw today, um, the interim data on the FY24 focus areas has given the state a direction for um, recommended rate adjustments. So. The, the feedback that you're giving us does matter, absolutely. And while this rate review cycle is soon coming to a close, um, we know our work at the state level is not done. Um, we'll continue to engage and work towards mutual understanding on fixed and variable costs, including our, our meeting next month. Um, we'll continue to work on getting a better understanding of the employment services rate, um, and that will enable us to hit the ground running for next year's rate review cycle. Um, so in the coming days, be on the lookout for a few things. Um, the meeting invitation for the meeting on the fixed and variable cost discussion. Um, the general, temp general ledger template that Cynthia was referring to um, for review. And um, announcements about the meeting schedule for the next cycle. Um, in addition to, it sounds, um, sounds like from discussion today, we'll come have some additional uh, follow-up items for you as well, um, particularly around the billable hour issue. Um, we go to the next slide, please. All right. So just a reminder that all meeting materials are available through the designated DDA website um, for this advisory group. And 
next slide, please. Uh, thank you again for attending and for your commitment to this important work. Um, we look forward to meeting again next month and planning our next great review cycle uh, in January. So thank you again, everyone.